This is our last session for the uh, China chat for the semester. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, with um, how this uh, aspect of the China initiative is, has unfolded. And I'm really, uh, I think I'm happiest that we have uh, started to build a, a, or let's say further develop this uh, nice community of people who want to chat about China uh, very frequently. Um, so thank you for making the time uh, every week. I know every people can't make it every week, but um, plenty of room. Come on in. Um, uh, and we're planning uh, quite a, um, a robust set of discussions for the spring. And now is a great time to send, you know, hey, Lyle, how about this uh, speaker? You know, it's it is obviously um, it's maybe a little easier if, if those speakers are local, you know, or uh, friends from the area or, or are uh, from southern New England. That, of course, you know, makes it very doable. But but we can absolutely please uh, think big and let's bring speakers from the West Coast and uh, uh, even from China. Yes, we will. We will do that. We want to do that. That's part of what we're about. Um, so please send those uh, suggestions along. I, ha I do have quite quite a list of uh, suggestions uh, that I'm working on that, that people have already given me. Uh, Yao Wen Lei at Harvard. Uh, I think David Logan from Yale will be here. Um, Tristan Brown. Uh, several people have suggested we get Tristan from MIT. Um, uh, Sheena Greitens will come from Texas to be with us on March 12th. You know, she's one of the leading uh, experts in the field. And um, I'm very pleased to announce uh, our first uh uh, well, we'll probably do a few chats before this, but February 11th, we'll have um, Xiang Li Ding from, from RISD, who has just wrote uh, a very exciting book on um, that's called Hydropower Nation. So I think this will be uh, a really uh, great start. And um, I want to anyway, I do hope you'll be there. I do. I do want to remind you we're moving from Tuesday to Wednesday. So please do uh, keep that in mind. And I, I know that will be a little that transition will be a little difficult for some people and i i do apologize but i think that's uh among other things we'll get our uh my sort of um co-sponsor if you will professor jose who's a fantastic china expert here at brown he will who, who's now in shanghai i believe um he will be able to join if they're on wednesday so anyway today i'm, I'm so thrilled to uh, welcome um a uh a great scholar in our field, a um, an important mentor of mine personally, uh, to join us here, and and we've been thrilled that uh, Professor Grant Road has joined us several times at China Chat and made a lot of contributions, and I hope he will uh, continue to join us when he's able. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, he does live in the area, and we're we're proud to call him a local, and and uh, I think you know very happy he's he's with us. This book. Um, that uh, I will make sure and pass around um, is a truly a stunning achievement. Uh, I got to watch it unfold. Um, a great power clashes along the Maritime Silk Road. And um, it's uh, so important today to understand uh, what's uh, unfolding in the world. Uh, I, th I think all, all one needs to uh, read is the, uh, the term Silk Road. And you know already that this is going to... Uh, be extremely important. After all, that's the foundation of uh, China's um, strategy today. But uh, beyond that, I want to say this book is, um, you know, not, not only will you learn, you know, about Taiwan and Southeast Asia, you'll learn a lot about South Asia, too. You will learn a lot about Korea and Japan as well. So I, I just can't uh, recommend this book highly enough. But, but let me, uh, without taking too much time here, just uh, read you uh, Professor Rhodes' uh, uh, brief biography here. Grant Rhodes, a senior lecturer at the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University, where he directs the Assessing China's Belt and Road Initiative Program. I think he has another book underway uh, from, that, uh, from that program. He is also an adjunct professor of Eurasian Maritime History at the U.S. Naval War College, just down the street in Newport, and a non-resident associate in research at the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Maybe you've heard of that place. Uh, Dr. Rhodes' research and publications focus on China's role in both historical and contemporary Eurasian maritime affairs. He lives and writes in the historic New England maritime village of Bristol, Rhode Island. So anyway, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Rhodes for being here. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much, Lyle. Uh, you know, we've had a long uh, friendship and association, and uh, I'll mention a couple of aspects of that uh, going forward. But uh, one of that aspects of association now is being invited to join you here at the China Chat, which is a great uh, privilege and opportunity for me. And uh, that uh, although I was traveling for much of the fall semester, uh, once I got back, I've come to the last three of the China Chats. And uh, I think it's been a uh, uh, really wonderful to see the kind of democracy of the mind with students and faculty talking with each other and uh, in uh, quite an open dialogue. What I'm going to do today is try to do about uh, a twofer, basically uh, a 20 minute book talk and then a 20 minute uh, travelogue uh, to tell you about some of the recent uh, travels that I've been on. So I'm going to move right ahead with this uh, because uh, time passes quickly. So the book itself uh, is the product of uh, some teaching that I started doing at the Naval War College that was about Asian maritime history. And uh, so I taught it twice and uh, I started out really teaching, uh, uh, trying to develop some case studies in the China Seas. And uh, this was because I was in the strategy department there where the, where the core curriculum is 10 case studies. And uh, going back to the Peloponnesian Wars, and then it jumps suddenly to the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, where there's a, uh, a lot of detailed uh, uh, material that is uh, studied there at the War College. And I found that uh, I thought there needed to be a deeper dive into the, uh, the background of the Asian cases, that there was a lot that went on in centuries previously uh, that were foundational for the people who live in the region. And uh, that, uh, you know, maybe the, uh, uh, the uh, officers who were at the Naval War College were not familiar with, although 70% of them are deployed somewhere in the Indo-Pacific. And I was teaching the, uh, the international relations of the Asia-Pacific, and I was sort of locked into the uh, Pacific side of things and not so much the Indo side of things. So uh, uh, Admiral Nirmal Verma, who was the former CNO of the uh, Indian Navy, uh, came in to audit my course the first time I taught it. And he said, well, what about uh, India? That's uh, part of Asia. And uh, so that uh, expanded my horizons. And uh, so that what I've got here is uh, three Indian case studies, which are the Chola, uh, the uh, Kunjali Marakar, and, uh, and the Maratha. Uh, and then there are three Chinese case studies, uh, including the Mongols, the early Ming, and the late Ming. Uh, <coughs> there is the uh, what I'm calling Samurai, which is really the Imjin War, which is uh, the uh, Japanese vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Korea, but also the Koreans that allied with the Chinese at the time. And then uh, I, I did a, uh, a study of the, uh, the Western uh, Indian Ocean, which is the Arabian Sea. But the, uh, it turns out that the Ottomans are actually a two-theater navy, both in the Indian Ocean as well as in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I've been to all of these places to do research on them, to bring them into uh, as background. I, I thought that I was going to do maybe a 19th century, move it forward uh, into the uh, Opium War and uh, the Perry expeditions opening Japan. But I thought I would uh, step back and do all pre-modern before in terms of not getting into the technological change with, uh, with uh, steam, but really, really the age of sail and some of ore during these times. So this is wrapped in a discussion of various theorists who have looked at uh, international relations theory primarily. And then uh, with some, uh, uh, each, each chapter, which is about uh, 30 to 40 pages long, uh, is, a, is a narrative that tells a story so that the facts are there. And then uh, the last uh, few pages are really uh, lessons learned from each of them, which I summarize in the conclusion. So that's the structure of the book. And uh, I'm just going to do one slide on each of these case studies to give you a little feel for it. And uh, so we'll, we'll move quickly through those. So the first one was the uh, Indian case study in the, <coughs> in the Eastern Indian Ocean during the Chola period in the 11th century. And uh, one of the key aspects of this was that um, in uh, 1025, uh, that the Sri Vijayans who were here in uh, Sumatra uh, were actually... Uh, uh, putting uh, tolls of up to 30% or, or even over 30% on all the shipping that was going through between the Song and the Chola in China. So this was uh, upsetting to the Chola and they decided to take some action. But instead of attacking uh, down the, uh, the Malacca Strait, uh, they came down the outside and had a sort of Sunda surprise through the Sunda, came back in and sacked Palembang uh, successfully and overthrew and they opened up trade during that period. So we're just uh, in uh, next year, uh, in, in fact, in about uh, three weeks, we're, we're getting into the, uh, the millennium 
uh, anniversary, the celebration of this particular case. So it's very old. And uh, of course, when Zheng He sailed on the Chinese side, there were great uh, celebrations in uh, 2005, which was 600 years after Zheng He sailed. So third case study is Zheng He. So we'll get to that. So uh, this is a, a painting by Sachin Sawant in the upper right of uh, uh, Song negotiators with Chola negotiators in trade after that raid took place. And I just had a wonderful uh, uh, WhatsApp communication with Sachin this morning and uh, that uh, he wishes he was here. There's a big colloquium going on in India tomorrow. I wish I was there, uh, but uh, we're in touch with each other and we're taking notes for each other as we, as we go forward. The second case study are the, is, are the Mongol maritime invasions. The Mongols, of course, were the greatest contiguous land empire in world history. And uh, they thought that uh, why not become a sea power as well? They made three attempts uh, to uh, conquer Japan, Vietnam, and Java. All of them were unsuccessful. They failed. They were unable to transition. So this uh, chapter is about that and how that took place. Uh, I'm standing next to a wall in Hakata Bay, which is the current uh, Fukuoka, which were walls that the uh, Japanese built. They were actually uh, about uh, 10 feet high, three meters high. Only the top <coughs> meter is exposed here. The rest is now underground. But uh, the, the Mongols, uh, being horsemen, they brought their horses along on the ships. Uh, not that they, that was the best way to attack, but that's what they knew. And uh, they couldn't get up over those 10-foot uh, walls and uh, were driven away. And then uh, uh, just uh, I'll go back to this, uh, the cover of the, the uh, uh, <clears throat> Japanese woodblock print on, on, the, uh, on the cover is actually of 1281 when the great uh, divine wind, the uh, uh, typhoon struck and sank the Mongol ships. And uh, so that was the, the kami, the gods, the kazi, the wind, the divine wind that sank uh, the Mongol ships. And uh, so uh, that has been revisited in uh, the 20th century uh, in an attempt to, of the uh, Japanese pilots to be that divine wind that was going to save Japan uh, in the 20th century, which didn't work out quite so well. So uh, Zheng He, all of you uh, know this because you're uh, into uh, China studies about uh, uh, one out of 10 or one out of 12 uh, officers at the Naval War College had heard of Zheng He when I taught there. So uh, even though they've been posted in the Pacific and so forth, they come quite hungry to, to learn in Newport because uh, they have very busy operational careers. And uh, so they, uh, they dig into these things. Uh, I've got a couple of slides from uh, Sri Lanka here. Uh, the, the trilingual stelae, very interesting. Uh, the only uh, uh, artifact uh, uh, of uh, uh, characters outside of China carved in stone that has been found. There are record, uh, records of them also in Malacca and in Calicut, for instance. Uh, but this is the only one that's known. But there are, there are three or four actually in China itself. This is a wall where when Zheng He uh, captured the, uh, the king of Sri Lanka and brought him back to, to uh, see the third uh, Ming emperor. Uh, it was at uh, where these uh, walls in Kata, which I, literally means fort, and it's just uh, on the uh, east side of, uh, of Colombo. Um, here we've got uh, an Indian case study again, and this is uh, uh, after the Europeans started to come into the Indian Ocean. And uh, the Portuguese had arrived with the uh, Gama in 1498. And uh, there was quite successful uh, asymmetrical uh, naval resistance to the Portuguese between 1520 and 1600 under the, uh, these uh, captains, so-called uh, Kunjali Marikar. And uh, uh, that uh, Kunjali is a dear Ali, Marikar is sea captain. Uh, so you had uh, these, uh, these Muslim uh, admirals who were working on behalf of the uh, uh, Zamoran of Calicut, uh, who is the Hindu king. And uh, so you had this uh, cooperative. Uh, so it says a lot about what the, uh, the uh, uh, communications were across the Arabian Sea at the time. That uh, there were uh, from Yemen primarily is where, and, the, and there were three mosques there in the neighborhood where many of them lived. And this is the, uh, the most recent the mosque, which was uh, basically uh, 11th century. And uh, there's uh, Judy and myself doing a selfie there in Malayalam uh, newspaper uh, in front of this mosque. And uh, Judy's an Arabic speaker. And uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, follows uh, some of these uh, trips that we're on and takes the lead in those part of the world. So, uh, this is my wife, Judy, back in the corner here. And uh, glad she's able to join us today. Um, so uh, anyway, the, the uh, resistance was quite successful for a period of about 80 years. And uh, then because of a, uh, a, a division, 
uh, between the uh, Zamor and between the king and between the admirals, there was a divide and conquer situation. And uh, so the, uh, you know, after that, the Portuguese were able to take firm control of the coast in those er areas of the south down in the Malabar region. Uh, the fifth case study are, are now, uh, again, uh, with uh, uh, the Ottomans having uh, taken control in 1453 uh, of uh, Constantinople uh, and then uh, building a navy that was uh, competitive and having uh, uh, galleys that were uh, equivalent to those of Venice. Uh, that they were able to uh, compete successfully during the 16th century. So I, sometimes I call this chapter the rise and stall of the Ottoman Navy in the 16th century because uh, they started in the island of Rhodes, successfully uh, driving the knights off the island. And uh, in fact, Suleiman the Magnificent was there directing that campaign. Uh, the great uh, uh, Admiral uh, Barbarossa, or pirate as he came to be known uh, on the other side. Um, and uh, uh, the, these are characters that I talk about in the book all uh, are representing states of various kinds. They're not uh, uh, strictly pirates, although they're labeled pirates often by, by the opposite side. But uh, anyway, here's the, uh, the, uh, both the two, the two uh, sides, the two theaters of the Ottoman Navy in the Indian Ocean and uh, in the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea. Then finally at Malta, uh, the uh, Knights had moved uh, back from Rhodes and, and resettled on Malta. And uh, so when the Ottomans attacked in 1565, they very nearly threw the knights out. But uh, it's a little bit complicated story. Uh, you might enjoy looking at the details of it. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, that's where the stall took place. And then they weren't able to expand any further into the Western Mediterranean, the Ottomans. And they were unable to use Malta as a stepping stone to go into Sicily, which was really the next step, and to go up into Europe. And uh, so we know how that played out in the 20th century that uh, Malta really was the, the stepping stone into Sicily for the Allies who have successfully used that. But this is a uh, what if of history. Um, so the Injun War uh, in the 1590s uh, that the, uh, the Japanese, after Hideyoshi united Japan, uh, thought that they wanted to expand actually to uh, take all of China. In fact, there were even some uh, ideas that they were going to go to India as well, uh, and uh, so very, very uh, big ideas. But uh, the uh, uh, success of the Korean Navy was really what stalled the Japanese, and so the war had two phases with a negotiation period in between that failed and uh, the war broke out again. And uh, so the great Yi uh, um, Sun-chin was a Chinese admiral who uh, is celebrated everywhere in, uh, in Korea and uh, you know, probably is better known there than George Washington is in the United States. Uh, you know, he's a tremendous uh, national figure. And uh, so, but, uh, you know, when, when, I, when I talk about these people that often people haven't heard of, of these uh, uh, people who have been very important in world history and, and uh, in Asian history. And uh, so part of my uh, uh, reason for, for doing this was to uh, acquaint a uh, wider American audience and, uh, and Western audience uh, with uh, some of these important cases. This is a, uh, from a, uh, uh, a, uh, a cable car looking down over where one of the great battles uh, took place off one of the islands off the south coast of Korea. These are the 23 battled spots that Yi Sun Sin actually won his battles in the middle map on the top, the top up here. Uh, it was never defeated uh, uh, against the Japanese. Uh, the main expulsion of the Dutch from Taiwan, uh, uh, you know, is China. Uh, people, you probably know the story of Zheng Chenggong of uh, Kokshinga, who drove the Dutch from Taiwan in 1662. And a uh, very important episode, the last major defeat of a Western power by China, and uh, very large in the Chinese uh, uh, imagination. This is the remains of the great uh, Dutch fort uh, in uh, uh, Tainan, in, uh, in uh, Taiwan. And uh, before uh, Zheng Chenggong went across to Taiwan successfully to expel the Dutch, he tried to, because it was right at the time of the Ming-Qing transition of dynasties and the Ming, the Qing had already taken over the capital in the north and were, and were pressing south, that uh, actually Zheng Chenggong was able to, uh, and, his, and his sons were able to hold out for about uh, an extra 40 years after the fall of the dynasty in the north. And it's uh, so a very complicated transition, but uh, uh, very important because uh, uh, Zheng Chenggong is considered to be the... Uh, uh, the, the repulsor of, of, of the Europeans to, on the mainland, and uh, yet he's the uh, he's the uh, Chiang Kai Shek of an earlier period who fled to Taiwan. So you had a divided country. So there are many parallels that people think about their history in relationship to this parallel from that early period. 
So the last of the case studies uh, I'll talk about today are the Maratha, uh, who were the uh, competitors to the Mughals in India. Uh, and uh, they lived uh, uh, more on the uh, eastern side. Maharashtra was really there, th that current province uh, or state is uh, uh, the core. And uh, along the coast was a family uh, of uh, admirals called Angre, the Angre clan. So Kanhoji Angre uh, was the greatest of these, and then he had several sons, and they went on really from the period of uh, 1699 until 1756, where they really, again, were undefeated against the British in asymmetrical naval warfare. So very interesting uh, study from that point of view for people who are uh, interested in the tactic and strategy uh, from a military point of view. Uh, but uh, this again was a, uh, a divide and conquer situation where, where the, uh, the, uh, the prime minister of, of the Maratha fell out with the admirals. And uh, so Clive of India on the, on the, on the West Coast, you know him from his, from his uh, uh, battle uh, victories on the, on the uh, East Coast of India, but uh, he actually uh, allied with the, uh, with the, with the uh, Maratha um, uh, foreign minister and then came in and expelled from Vijayadurg, which uh, literally means the uh, victory fort, uh, sometimes called the uh, Gibraltar of the East, uh, that Clive came in the back door and actually was able to expel the Maratha at the time. So um, that's the, uh, the uh, case studies. And uh, uh, these are uh, some of the, uh, the uh, theorists that uh, I discuss in the book. And uh, I won't go into uh, detail about it, but, uh, you know, Mahan and Spikeman, uh, I probably give uh, mo most uh, uh, influential uh, theorists uh, regarding these particular cases. Uh, Mackinder is coming back into vogue uh, with the uh, Ukraine uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, core uh, continental point of view, whereas uh, Spikeman was very much on the on the maritime side, the per maritime perimeter and so forth. And uh, there are many lessons to be learned. I've been talking about some of them. I mean, if you want to compare the uh, the Korea Strait with, uh, you know, the channel and that uh, continent to island, uh, it's about scope and scale, it's very similar, 100 miles apart. You know, the uh, amphibious uh, Mongol raids or the samurai going the other direction, they're all between 100,000 and 150,000 soldiers, just the exact size of the Normandy invasion, you know, when it, when it took place in the, in the uh, 1940s. And uh, so that there are some parallels like this. But anyway, you may know some of these people, uh, uh, perhaps uh, not others, but uh, these are some of the key uh, characters that I discussed in the book. So uh, Lyle mentioned I'm interested in ancient and modern uh, Silk Road. So uh, you know, carrying through that thinking, you can see how the great medieval explorers, Marco Polo, Ibn Battuta, Zheng He, their maps, there's a great deal of similarity in terms of how they traveled and, and what they covered. China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, uh, maps that most people have seen uh, is along the lines of the, uh, the one on the bottom right. Uh, I myself, uh, as I'll mention, I'm, I'm working on uh, Belt and Road Initiatives. Uh, this was the uh, my research itineraries, which tends to look like all of those maps that we've been talking about from uh, 2012 to 2019. And uh, then uh, I actually uh, finished my, my last uh, trip before the pandemic and then uh, actually couldn't go out, so I had a chance to write. So it actually worked out okay for me. Uh, but uh, I, as uh, Lyle said, I've been running the, uh, the Belt and Road uh, analysis program at Boston University over the past five years or so. We had a big conference on the right, which we're now uh, developing into a, a book that's quite close to uh, uh, being uh, ready to go to press. And uh, um, that uh, um, that will be coming out. And uh, you know, if I'm part of this China chat, as I hope to be going forward, and I've actually arranged my schedule to be up here on Wednesdays, uh, you know, this next semester. So. You know, I very much enjoyed these these talks that we had. So uh, here we've got, uh, I, you know, I, I attended three conferences in China, uh, one in uh, in uh, July this year uh, that was in uh, Qingdao up in the northeast, uh, the port. And uh, there's a new uh, World Sinology Center there. So what is this all about? Uh, this is a part of the Beijing Language and Culture University. And uh, so China is very interested in looking at its past uh, and uh, and uh, uh, establishing narratives that uh, uh, are part of their vision going forward, and you can see that in the in the whole rationale of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, that uh, they're they're uh, saying that uh, China, both by land and by sea, connected with the world historically over many centuries, 
uh, which are under review by scholars. They're interested in their own scholarship, but they're also interested in the scholarship of uh, scholars from, from the United States, but also everywhere else in the world. So in the Sinology Center, there is about half Western uh, Sinologists, about half Eastern Sinologists, and the pictures on the walls, uh, you know, the, the, the big painting going in is uh, a, a dialogue between uh, uh, Confucius and uh, Aristotle. Uh, sitting, uh, w what would that conversation be like? And uh, it reminded me of uh, uh, in uh, in November of 2019 uh, when I was in Greece and uh, that uh, Xi Jinping was there. And uh, so he was there to uh, negotiate some more development uh, in the port of Piraeus and a number of agreements were signed at that time. But uh, his last parting shot before he left was he, he said, well, you know, uh, Greece is the uh, cradle of Western civilization and China is the cradle of Eastern civilization. And yes, Britain, please give those uh, uh, Parthenon pieces back uh, to Greece. So he supported the, the Greeks uh, uh, in that particular way. And uh, that's been uh, one of the most successful of the Belt and Road projects is that uh, uh, Piraeus project, I think both from the point of view of the Chinese, but also uh, of the Greeks that it has had a positive effect and really given an alternative uh, for the for the Greeks vis-a-vis -vis, uh, trying to uh, work with Brussels on, on development issues. Uh, so GCI, these are, these are global initiatives. There are four. The Belt and Road Initiative is the first of them. And then there's the, uh, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global Civilization Initiative. And uh, so uh, th this is a uh, very conscious kind of framing on the uh, economics, politics, and cultural side. So the cultural the civilization side is a really a, uh, you know, a, a major soft power push. And uh, so when I went to uh, Beijing at the end of this last trip that I was on, uh, there was a, uh, you know, two days of just discussion about the Global Civilization Initiative. They've opened new museums that are related to this, uh, how China sees uh, uh, cultures and, and the civilizations in other parts of the world, and they're trying to build bridges. So the conference had uh, about 100 uh, Chinese. Uh, it had about 110 internationals, of which I was the only American uh, there on this particular one. In, uh, in uh, July, I was, uh, that was just with the Americans up in the Sinology Institute in Qingdao. There were 16 Americans. And uh, so that was a more intensive look at uh, uh, American scholarship vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, but uh, but uh, to go and to uh, be there with these uh, scholars from uh, all six inhabited co continents and uh, to uh, uh, interact with them, uh, it, you know, very uh, enlightening, uh, not only for the Chinese, but for people from all over the world who are going there to find out what what uh, what are the questions, uh, what's what are, what are the findings and so forth. Um, so it happens that uh, tomorrow, uh, this uh, this uh, India Maritime Her Heritage uh, Conclave begins in New Delhi. This is where I wish I, we, or I, where I could be, uh, because uh, uh, Sachin Sawant, the one who did that painting that I that I uh, showed you earlier, he was our guide in all three of our uh, research trips in China. And because he knew the maritime history and his paintings, uh, one of his uh, his major commissions over many years is doing paintings for the Indian Navy. Uh, of uh, historic scenes. In other words, how do, how do you see and how do you interpret what data do you, do you pull together and to put into these paintings? And uh, you can see that that one of the, uh, you know, the Chola Sung Tre is kind of an iconic look at uh, uh, both that it was happening, but something about the dress and the, and the demeanor and so forth and interpretation certainly in art, but uh, I think a very uh, uh, interesting way of getting people interested uh, in uh, historic material. And uh, so it's a great draw in India. So he actually said he's going to be my fly on the wall at this, uh, at this conference over the next couple of days. And uh, uh, so we're going to stay in touch about that. From 10 years ago, uh, uh, some of you know about Project Mausum, which is the uh, uh, concept of the Indians of the maritime community of the Indian Ocean, maybe 39 countries that, that border the Indian Ocean. And uh, so uh, this is a... Uh, you know, going forward in time, if China has its Global Civilization Initiative, this is kind of an Indian thrust with a, uh, with a similar idea. And of course, India is one of those countries that has never joined the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, for a variety of reasons. And of course, uh, part of it is geopolitical and Pakistan uh, is uh, very much is the, is the largest of the Belt and Road Initiative projects. You know, that uh, is a problem for India. 
And, uh, but uh, Sri Lanka is also next door with uh, major projects and so forth. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I, I'm just working on a piece right now for this book on uh, China, India in the past and going forward. So that's a particular interest of mine. So uh, that's about uh, 25 minutes. So I've got about 15 minutes uh, to talk to you about uh, these uh, travels. So I was on a ship called the, uh, uh, the Idun, or the Zhao Shan Idun. And uh, on the right, you can see that I, I was going from Shanghai and uh, came down along the coast uh, uh, to uh, uh, Ningbo or Zhou Shan and uh, Wenzhou and uh, Fuzhou and Xiamen and then down to Hong Kong. We went up to Guangzhou and so forth. So uh, when I got off in Wenzhou and I was in the old uh, British uh, uh, consulate there from the 1840s, you know, after the first Opium War, you know, this was a map that was on the wall there, the one on the left. And uh, so the uh, Treaty of Nanjing in 1842 established five treaty ports for China. And then Hong Kong as an island actually went back to, to, uh, to Britain at that time. And uh, it, it happens that Zhou Shan was the, uh, was the uh, competing island up just off Ningbo. And it almost, that was almost the, the uh, alternate, alternate choice, which I, which I really didn't know anything about before I got there. So this is, a, this is a, quite interesting for me. But uh, the fact that the, uh, the uh, Viking uh, cruise lines, which has the, uh, the number one rankings for the so-called enrichment programs, its lecture programs, and uh, uh, to try, it's for people who are uh, who want to be thinking rather than drinking is the way they put it. Uh, but you know, it's it, it's a little bit more like thinking and drinking. But uh, <laughs> you know, it, uh, everyone everyone has a pretty good time. But at the same time, they're very curious, and uh, uh, so they they establish a partnership with the China Merchants uh, Group, uh, and uh, so that they yeah, China Merchants was actually staffing the ship with about uh, three hundred staff, about two hundred eighty of which were Chinese. And uh, although uh, in the pandemic, they had uh, a Chinese clientele for both along the China coast and then going to Korea and to Japan, that they really wanted to try to figure out how to serve a, uh, a, uh, an international and a Western uh, clientele. And so that was part of uh, what was going on with this. But the fact that they chose this, this route that's a dead ringer for what was, you know, what the, the, the start of the great century of humiliation and inviting people back along uh, the China coast to actually see these places and what they are right now. I mean, they, they don't really talk uh, about this. I just happened to notice, you know, that, that they were exactly the same ports. So here at the, uh, at the China chat, I've been very, uh, uh, you know, uh, moved by, by the talks that have been done. Uh, you know, for instance, about the, uh, the history wars, I've been very interested in this subject and uh, Lyle has just come out with this. I didn't, I didn't actually see it until after uh, this talk uh, by uh, Seung Yun Lee, who was talking about Korea, Japan, Korea, China relations, but really with the Korea Center. And uh, your article talks more about the uh, Japan China uh, side of things. And, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, that uh, Lyle uh, brings up uh, four uh, points at the end of really policy recommendations of how, how do we work on issues of reconciliation. And uh, I'm hoping that. Uh, Maybe somewhere down along the line, that this can come back to become a, 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 a deeper discussion again in the China chat. So that's one of my thoughts about where things might go. Zhu Ching Li uh, gave this uh, wonderful talk, but I've, I've gone and read her Daughters of the Flower Fragrant Garden, which is the family estate in Fuzhou at the uh, Three Lanes and, and uh, Seven Alleys location, this very historic area of Fuzhou. And, uh, uh, I, I am just riveted by Fujian province uh, currently and uh, well, by uh, multiple visits. And uh, so uh, this uh, gave such a, uh, a, uh, a depth of fabric to understanding things in, uh, in Fujian uh, from a very personal point of view, a family point of view. I mean, you can understand so much about the, uh, you know, what the Chinese uh, civil war was about by just by uh, looking at these two sisters that I'd caught on opposite sides of the bamboo curtain. So I, uh, you know, very, very, very important for me uh, in terms of rethinking, reshaping my thought about that particular part of the world. And then uh, uh, with uh, Marianne O'Donnell, really looking at that uh, Pearl River uh, Delta area and uh, just that fascinating uh, uh, area that, uh, um, that I'll be going back to. Uh, and uh, so this is a shot I took from the uh, top of the Shanghai Tower uh, looking down, which is the third tallest building in the world from Pudong. And uh, so you can see uh, 
uh, the, uh, the river, the Huangpu. You see the Suzhou Creek right here. You see the old uh, uh, international concession area, the Bund right here. Uh, and then this is the area north, which is the uh, Chinese section in 1937 when war broke out. And uh, so that uh, all the Chinese were pouring over this bridge, which still is there, trying to get into the International Center to uh, get, get uh, away from the, the Japanese who were pushing in from the north. Uh, just at that, at that time, uh, the uh, uh, Chinese had opened their doors and Shanghai had opened its doors to the Jews who were uh, uh, just coming under persecution uh, in, in, in Germany and, and the rest of Europe. Uh, so uh, we went to the, uh, the uh, Jewish Museum there uh, where 20,000 in 1937 actually came and was settled. 3,000 of them, you know, on the uh, south side behind the Bund because they had enough money to live in that area. And the others were poorer and they, they, the other 17,000 were in, in, the, uh, in the northern area. So uh, as uh, Judy and I were in that museum and uh, there was a young uh, Chinese guy taking us around, I said, well, you know, in 2013, a decade ago, I, was, uh, I had gone up to Suzhou Creek and walked along. I had read uh, in Peter Harmson's book, on Stalingrad on the Yangtze, uh, which was about the Battle of Shanghai, a little footnote about this area of a warehouse on the North Bank that uh, uh, had been uh, uh, kind of an Alamo, a holdout for the Chinese, uh, th th that the Japanese were trying to press them uh, south and uh, you know to take all the nationalists out at that time. So she said, oh, you should go up there and see that place again. So uh, that's what we did. And uh, um, uh, this... Uh, well, I'll do one slide before I talk about that. But this number of 300,000 is the, is the number that's em emblazed into the minds of uh, uh, most Chinese about how many people died in, in Nanjing. And uh, then the, uh, the 20,000, the story going in uh, into the Jewish Museum was basically that the, uh, the Germans are to the Jews as the Japanese are to the Chinese. And uh, so... Uh, that, uh, that, that, that's a, a, a point that they're making, uh, both at the beginning, the first slide and the last slide, and uh, that the fact that they were open uh, to all of these refugees, they're also making that point as well. But uh, um, here is this uh, warehouse that I mentioned where, where uh, there was this holdout on the north side of Suzhou Creek, which you see in the, in the foreground in the upper slide. So in 2013, when I went there, based on this little footnote dragging Judy along, uh, that uh, I, I opened the door and here was this statue uh, in the upper right. And uh, this is uh, uh, Xie Jin Yuan, who was the uh, um, lieutenant colonel, who was the uh, defender. And uh, so there were flowers around the base and so forth. And I thought, well, this is something, you know, this is a nationalist soldier. I didn't expect to find this here. This is something. And uh, but then this uh, uh, just uh, recently when we were back at the Jewish Museum, they said you should go back and see this place. This is now the renovation of it where they've you know, cleaned up the white paint and they've opened up the wall. It's over on this side over here. You can see the artillery and the bullet holes here in the wall and so forth. And it's now a multi-story museum commemorating uh, this. So there's a lot of museum development in China, all over China. And I've been to half a dozen uh, different museums on, on uh, this uh, latest trip. And uh, I just thought I'd bring you this, uh, this one example. And... Uh, that uh, it's quite dramatic inside because uh, you have these uh, um, uh, wax and uh, bronze effigies of uh, the players uh, uh, down here in the in the lower left. You've got Japanese coming in through the window, uh, being repelled uh, in the uh, one at the top. This is actually a uh, nationalist soldier jumping out a fifth story window with a grenade falling onto these uh, Japanese who are under these uh, uh, these uh, metal doors down below and so forth. So this is, uh, I, I never had heard of a, uh, you know, a Chinese uh, kamikaze, you know, that, uh, that uh, engaging in a, uh, you know, a suicide uh, death mission and so forth. But uh, anyway, very, very dramatic portrayal, but they're, they're telling the story of successful, they call it, and they made a film about it this last year too, called uh, The 800. These are the, uh, the ones who were in the, uh, in the uh, warehouse itself who were defending. There were probably about 300, and uh, the 800 was misinformation that was put out to make uh, the Japanese think that there were more there at the time. I don't know if that's part of the current story, but that was part of the information I picked up uh, 10 years earlier. Uh, so we're leaving Shanghai. We're coming down now around the coast to Joshan, which is just off Ningbo, and then uh, to, uh, to Wenzhou, which is the uh, great entrepreneurial uh, uh, steam pot of uh, China. Uh, that uh, pushes uh, 
uh, China going forward. So uh, in, uh, in Doshan, it's a great Buddhist center. And uh, so Putuo is the mountain uh, where Guanyin uh, re repeatedly lived. And uh, so there was this great uh, Zhang Yimou production. Uh, if you remember Zhang Yimou, he's a, he's a filmmaker. He did Red Sorghum about the, uh, the uh, uh, resistance to the Japanese uh, uh, at a point in time. So, uh, but she was portrayed uh, in front of the sea. So I inquired about that. I'm very interested in Mazu, who's a China, the, uh, the Chinese uh, goddess of the sea, who's, who uh, uh, has temples in many places. I visited about 30 of them all the way from, uh, uh, from uh, Taiwan and uh, down to uh, Indonesia. Um, and uh, so uh, here Guanyin is in front of the water. So anyway, she also about 5% of her portfolio is the goddess of mercy, is, the, uh, is a, a goddess for sailors as well. So she's not dedicated to that. But uh, in the uh, in the ship in the morning, I usually take my uh, cappuccino up in the uh, in the uh, lounge that's uh, on the seventh deck, looking forward. And uh, so as as dawn comes up, and I see the uh, uh, the mist rising, and I was there the day after being uh, watching this uh, show of Johnny Mo's, uh, the uh, uh, general manager of the ship uh, came up and uh, wanted to know how I was enjoying my cappuccino and. Uh, and uh, I said, yeah, I was, and, and what did I think of the show last night? I said, it was a very interesting show. I, I was surprised to see uh, Guan Yin in front of the water like this. So he started talking to me about uh, the fact that uh, in Sanya, uh, the statue on the right, uh, that uh, ever since they put up that statue, the, there have been no more typhoons in, the, in Hainan <laughs> since, uh, and uh, uh, so forth. So uh, um, anyway, we'll come back to Mazu later. But here at Wenzhou, just one impression that... Uh, that uh, in the fourth century, that uh, there was a philosopher named Guo Pu who apparently laid out uh, the uh, uh, city of Wenzhou by the stars of the Big Dipper. So I, I heard this, and uh, so I, the uh, the guide that we had on, I said, "Well, is there is there any information about that?" So he immediately went online and got me this picture of, the, of an overlay of the Big Dipper on that. Uh, so this is a, a Tristan Brown thing when he shows up. We can talk to him about the. Uh, so much in the Zhu Qing Li's book was about the, the, the uh, area called the uh, the uh, three lanes and seven alleys, the Sanfang, uh, Qi Xiang, and uh, that uh, you know dozens of uh, important uh, intellectuals, philosophers, uh, uh, graduates of the imperial exams lived in this area. So very influential uh, neighborhood, and uh, we had uh, a nice lunch there with a uh, a faculty member at Fuzhou University called Su Wenjing, and. Uh, she uh, has written two books on Chinese maritime affairs, so I, I'm hopeful that we'll have a, uh, a dialogue about my interests and her interests in that area. Uh, there's a map from my book of the uh, of Jinmen and Shaman, uh, and uh, then a map of the uh, uh, you know the Battle of Gunungto uh, in uh, 1949. You know, a dead ringer. This is described in, in the great detail in Zhu Cheng Li's book, and uh, so you see that. Uh, that the Zheng family that Zheng Chenggong came from, that this was really their home base, was uh, were, were the two islands. And uh, so very important during that period. And uh, uh, Xing Hang is somebody we might want to think about uh, inviting, who uh, who wrote about the Zheng family. And uh, his appendices show that the uh, income from the Zheng family, from the 900 chunks, was actually greater than that of the Dutch East India Company. Huh. And uh, so uh, anyway, it's... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, prob probably the richest man in the world was Zhang Chenggong's father uh, at the time, and uh, so that uh, you know, these these are aspects of uh, of, of history that, uh, although a great deal is written from the from the Dutch and the English side of, of the great companies, uh, that this is a, a side that needs to be known more. There are four UNESCO World Heritage sites in Fujian Province uh, on the cruise. We went to three of them. In Gulangyu, there's this great statue of Zheng Chenggong, as well as uh, it was the, the consular area, uh, very important historically. The Tulo are the uh, the uh, houses of the uh, of the uh, Hakka or the Kajia, uh, and uh, that this one is called Four Dishes and One Soup because there are four round roofs and one uh, square one in the middle, which is the soup tureen. And uh, then Chuanzhou uh, has 22 different sites that are related to the, the, their designation as a World Heritage Site. We went to four of them, so there's a lot more to see. And I didn't see uh, the maritime sites, some of them that, I, that I'd like to see. And then uh, in the conference right after, uh, I got invited to a conference in Fujian province, and I got up to Wuyishan, which is this beautiful place. And this is another uh, Zhang Yimou production 
uh, in that area about uh, uh, tea production as part of that. And it's also the great uh, uh, place of the revival of Neo-Confucianism with the Song uh, philosopher, Ju Xi. Uh, this is where he lived. In Fuzhou itself, uh, uh, here on the, uh, on the left side, there were these uh, bronze statues up on a hillside. That was really just a year ago, Xi Jinping commemorated these as playing between American and Chinese children. It commemorates a story you know, from the early uh, 20th century about an American who lived there and uh, that uh, now has maintained a relationship. So it's kind of a, uh, a, a metaphor for the possibility of American-Chinese uh, friendship. And uh, so uh, this is the so-called uh, story of uh, Gulian. You can Google that if you want to and uh, learn something about that. Uh, in, in Xiamen, again, we've got a, a, another story of, uh, of, uh, of uh, feng shui, and uh, which are these daggers. I was told uh, are these two tall buildings right on the waterfront that uh, the feng shui was poor there with those daggers pointed right into the wind. And uh, from the other side, I took a picture and you see to the left uh, here of the, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a circular building that winds up. It was actually built ostensibly to change the feng shui. Of, uh, of, uh, of the area of that particular uh, location. And then uh, this family down here, these two are, are actually faculty members at the uh, Shaman University, considered to be the most beautiful university campus in, in China with its own beach and uh, lakes and so forth, lovely place. But uh, anyway, they moved off the Shaman campus uh, because uh, she was not becoming pregnant and they moved to another place that had better feng shui. So this uh, little boy on our right is the uh, product of that uh, good uh, feng shui move. Um, Fujian Maritime Thank Legacy. You. We're only time for questions, so. Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, uh, these are just a lot of uh, activity on, uh, on Maritime, a, uh, a city that was built actually for Taiwanese uh, to invest in uh, now has empty buildings and so forth. So it's a, uh, you know, a dream that hasn't uh, really developed, but there's a great deal uh, to go back and, and uh, develop just uh, some images of the four uh, great ports in the Pearl River Delta. Um, this uh, uh, Mazu temple we found uh, in Shenzhen. And uh, I'll just point out that uh, Mazu is the only uh, Chinese uh, non-living who has a registration card, has a hukou card. I, Born in 960, uh, third, uh, in March the 23rd. It's actually right here in our card, 960, or grade 23. So, and then 001, which means, I guess, gives her some priority as an individual person. But anyway, uh, this is uh, something I thought you might find uh, curious and interesting. And, uh, you know, as somebody who, uh, who is a, uh, a sailor and so forth, I have my own mods who given to me by somebody who lived in Taiwan for a long time. And uh, so this is uh, someone I always thank when I come back from my uh, excursions around Narragansett Bay and elsewhere uh, for, for returning safely. So I think that's uh, last slide. Just the, uh, my, my next trip is going to be the same as the other one, but go to the three uh, further north ports, uh, to Qingdao, to Dalian, and to Tianjin. And you can see that all seven of the great uh, ports of China are on that. So it's a, uh, to go out and actually see 30 container ships and 80 fishing ships at the same time on the sea as we did as we were sailing, that uh, these were the size and scale of uh, Zheng He's voyages you know, from, the, uh, from the 15th century. So, so that's it. So thank you very much. Really wonderful. And I, um, I, I do uh, hope we can get a few questions in here. I'll, I'll uh, maybe pitch a, a quick one uh, first. Uh, but feel free to leave as uh, necessary. I think uh, Professor Road will stick around a little bit and chat uh, if we go a little over. But um, uh, Grant, I um, I moved to ask quickly, especially since you said you have a paper underway on this. Uh, but I think one of the all the case studies are amazing. But one that strikes me as so important is that first one that that kind of lays out this possibility that China and India really share this. Uh, both share a, a, an important maritime tradition, but also that they both want, you know, basically freedom of navigation, if you will, through through those critical straits that, that define them. So my question is, you know, are you um, generally optimistic or pessimistic about the um, not just Sino-Indian relations, which we're all following, but also, you know, in particular, the kind of maritime aspect of that? Yeah. Um, but 
folks other questions too. Mention that we should collect a few because we don't have much time. Okay, yeah. Why don't you? Any anybody else? And, uh, have we're recording this, so if you can get the microphone. I noticed a lot of your, a uh, lot of the locations mentioned were very like Southern Chinese locations. Um, I'm wondering if you kind of note, find a reason why there's much more emphasis on international travel in Southern China over, <clears throat> excuse me, Northern China. Right. So well, uh, I'll start maybe with uh, just, just responding to this, so if, if anybody's thinking about questions. But uh, I, I think that's a very interesting question. I, I think that the, uh, you know, the places that are known for travelers, uh, you know, especially from the West, are uh, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, and Xi'an. So those are, those are not all, all Southern. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, this idea of uh, travel along the coast, that this was the great maritime area, so you're hearing a lot about that from me because I was able to get on this uh, on this ship where they're opening up uh, to to uh, survey this part of southeastern China. So I think that that's uh, more uh, because uh, there are extensions on all of these uh, uh, cruises to go to uh, cities that are inland and so forth. But uh, what you're seeing is southeast China largely because uh, uh, th this is the, the the water part of the version. So I, I think that uh, China would like this, this part of Chinese history to be known more. And the, the, uh, of course, it is the, uh, the driver of Chinese economy, you know, first of all, with Deng Xiaoping opening up uh, Shenzhen originally. And uh, um, so that, uh, uh, you know, the cities all along, and uh, as I mentioned, Wenzhou uh, is this uh, driver of entrepreneurial activity really all over the world with uh, Wenzhou people. Uh, um, but... Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I have sometimes I think about this question, uh, like I, it took me a while before I got to, uh, to Boston, Miami, uh, to San Diego and to Seattle and sort of four cornered and got to have a sense of all of that. But, uh, I was, uh, in, in July, I was in the Qingdao in the Northeast. I was in Yunnan in the Southwest, uh, over the last uh, 25 years, I've been many times in Xi'an. Uh, we helped to establish and run a, a bilingual a, a program between Brookline High School in Boston and the, and the uh, Gaoshan School in Xi'an. And uh, so that uh, throbbing heart of traditional China is very much on my screen and for many people. So I think that that idea, you know, as you, as you try to come to grips with understanding China, that really uh, trying to do some visits in various places, it, it is, <coughs> you know, it does have that parallel that I feel with the United States. There's a great deal of... Uh, of a variety in terms of culture and history and background. And uh, so, and I, I think that people are traveling on the ship that they, they they were just increasingly intrigued by what they were seeing and the openness with which they were received and so forth. So I, I think, I'm hopeful that there'll be more opening and exchange on this front as does Xi Jinping and others in China. But uh, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Grant, I just wanted to say one uh, other thing that the filmmaker who choreographed those two uh, shows that you mentioned. He was actually the choreographer who designed the opening um, celebra celebrations of the 2008 Olympics. So these are very large displays with hundreds of people choreographed um, that Grant showed. But The seating is actually on a big uh, uh, turntable so that uh, the whole a panorama all the way around 360 degrees that it actually it gets dark and moves and then a new uh, vista opens up, you know, that's been reset, the stage has been reset. I think the, uh, the India question, uh, Lyle, is a, is a huge uh, uh, question and uh, that, uh, um, you know, going forward, the demography uh, for India uh, is uh, that India may have 300 million, 400 million more people than China, you know, in, uh, by 2050 or something like that. It'll be a much younger population. And uh, so that uh, the, the possibilities for, for economic growth and so forth are, uh, are there. The costs are also you know, part of that picture and, and how that uh, plays out together. But uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, although Modi has not uh, uh, gone out to join any of the Belt and Road Initiative things, it is a part of the, uh, the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And so forth. So, you know, I think that there is this interest in straddling and doing some things together on the part of India and China. But uh, I think that uh, 
there's a uh, a, a book uh, just out now called the the Golden Road. I think it released in Britain, but uh, not released yet here in the States in April. I think it's coming out, uh, which is really the a, a very strong uh, uh, effort to show how India was really the major civilizational force in the Indian Ocean, rather than China. And you know, of course, Indochina has in it just in the name all of that competition that goes back for two thousand years. Uh, in that in the Southeast Asia, so that's really the the, uh, the prime area of uh, of contestation, and I, and uh, India has not with its uh, look east and act east uh, uh, programs uh, that have gone on for the last twenty years or so, uh, you know, are uh, very much India's push, and as India becomes more capable, uh, uh, and uh, they do have a capable navy now. Uh, and uh, not uh, grown in the way that China's has, and you've been a student of that for a long time. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, I, you know, I, I see that uh, that uh, India's uh, uh, potential is large, vis vis a vis uh, uh, how it plays its role in that part of the world, and uh, is likely to expand over time. Yeah. Final question here in the back. I think okay. You're... Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> First off, thanks for coming in. Um, you mentioned much recent museum building within China, and I was wondering if that was part of an internal cultural consolidation, some other factor, something along those lines. Well, I, I think it relates heavily to uh, uh, an interest in, in uh, telling the Chinese narrative, in other words, understanding their own history, but actually having a, a point of view about it. So. That uh, you know, I found that there were what, what seemed to be kind of a national perspective, even in, for instance, in this Haitan, which is this town that was built to try to attract Taiwanese down in the in the uh, Fuzhou region, uh, that uh, uh, you have a, uh, a a story of this being a major road on the Maritime Silk Road, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, you uh, have uh, in the uh, Fujian Arsenal, which is a separate museum, the naval arsenal there. Uh, very, very uh, elaborate storytelling about 19th century and how the people of Fujian were dedicated to technological progress and these huge French drill presses for building ships, you know, are, are in there. So it didn't work out too well for the with the French in the long run, but it was a period of time. So the, the story is about the self-strengthening and so forth. It doesn't really get into how the uh, the Chinese lost the Sino-Japanese War, that they really didn't strengthen themselves in the same way the Japanese War did, the Japanese did at the time, and uh, you know, which is a different story. But uh, uh, in any event, uh, I, I saw that even the smallest local museums, and even one, for instance, in this uh, three lanes and seven alleys area, uh, a three courtyard house that was just filled with maritime uh, stories and memorabilia, that the, that the final uh, uh, little tablet was about the, uh, the connection of uh, uh, Fu Fuzhou with the, with the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, the Maritime Silk Road is being a, a major point on that. So that was kind of a national point made on it. So it isn't all just uh, locally developed and so forth. Uh, so there's some unity of, uh, of uh, presentation. That's great, Grant. Uh, maybe I'll take the liberty of pitching a last question here. Um, uh, I recall, uh, well, it must have been 20 years ago, reading some Chinese scholars saying, you know, um, probably China shouldn't build aircraft carriers because if it does, it will, you know, ruffle a lot of feathers and, and the maritime make everybody nervous. Uh, and, and it really shouldn't, it, it really is a continental power, not a maritime power. So it, and, and trying to become a maritime power would, you know, it's either beyond its capability or will to, you know, just alienate so many other countries, you know, Japan and so forth. Um, and today, China, I mean, of course, we see that they put those concerns aside and went for it. Uh, you know, I'm told, well, I can see that China sort of building building warships like like dumplings, not like sausages, like dumplings. I'm told. So, you know, clearly China, you know, you pointed out its ports, uh, not just its navy, its, its merchant fleet and so forth. But China can. can Conceptualize China as sort of a hybrid power that's both a continental power, and maritime power. Do you think they can, you know, can they sort of walk and chew gum that way? Is that from your, you know, from your thinking on your book? Um, is this is this a kind of stable development path for China to be a hybrid uh, continental maritime power? 
Well, it's a it's a little bit of a complex question uh, in the sense that uh, you know Xi Jinping. Sometimes you, you see that he compares himself with uh, uh, Qian Long. Uh, I see that uh, maybe maybe Yang Le, the third uh, Ming emperor, is uh, a little more like it. Actually, a Han, you know, rather than a Manchu. Uh, and uh, uh, so that, um, but studying that, and always in all of the Belt and Road forums, he talks for two paragraphs or two pages about Zheng He. And so forth, who who from lasted 28 years, right, from 1405 to 1433. Now, China is already 1.7 times that now in terms of its development of its navy and so forth. So and it doesn't seem like it's getting any weaker right now or the commitment is getting any weaker right now. So I think it's a very different scenario, uh, you know, going forward that they are that they've looked at that period and they've decided that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, we don't have to retract. We don't have to be second. Uh, you know they're, they're going to keep they're going to keep pushing they're going to keep developing, I think, and uh, to be uh, you know first rank uh, uh, naval power which uh, they, they are on the edge of at the moment and uh, you know, of course you you know that well but uh, you know the the, the the projections go out to uh, to uh, to twenty fifty and uh, so this is a uh, it's a longer time frame but they, they've taken a close look at their history and uh, I think that that's playing a part and uh, how they're uh, they, they're resolved actually. Uh, uh, maintain their presence as a maritime power. That's great. Uh, and this, you know, people who are interested in these questions, absolutely take a look at this book. I mean, reading between the lines, I think uh, what Professor Rode is also saying is, you know, we, we can't, you know, uh, Americans tend to be so Eurocentric, you know, if they know any history, it's uh, European history and that we need to know this Asian history uh, so much better. We all do. Uh, anyway, please join me and uh, thank you, Professor Rode, for visiting us. Thank you. And, uh, we're glad you, uh, you will continue to join us at China Chat. But thanks for coming, everybody, today, and wishing you a very happy holidays. One well, last point I'd like to really thank Lyle for all his organizational and leadership efforts. Okay.